as we um, continue um, this morning and, God willing, next Sunday morning to um, finish off our journey through the Sermon on the Mount. Our reading this morning is Matthew chapter 7 and from verse 15 through to verse 23, now on page 972. Jesus says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognise them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And I watched an interview recently with Martin Lewis, um, the money-saving expert. I don't know how many of you have come across uh, Martin Lewis, he does quite a lot on the, on the telly and on the radio, there's loads of kind of consumer rights uh, type stuff, finance, money management, that kind of stuff, really good stuff, um, actually, he's a really useful uh, guy. But the interview I watched with him was a meeting with a man who had followed Martin Lewis's advice on an advert, and he'd invested in some sort of crypto thing, and then later discovered that he had been conned out of about £75,000 because it wasn't actually a Martin Lewis advert. It was a computer-generated deep fake. It was a scam. It looked like the real thing, but it was a falsehood. And it was a costly falsehood to fall for. And on the news, a couple of weeks ago, there was that awful story about people dying in Laos after drinking shots that they bought in a bar. Shots which purported to be some kind of spirit vodka, I think, but which were actually heavily diluted with methanol. It looked like the real thing, but it was false. And it was deadly. Or consider the humble one pound coin. I meant to have a one pound coin in my pocket. I haven't got one, but I'm sure you all know what a one pound coin looks like. Um, or maybe if you've arrived in the country more recently, you know what the new one pound coin looks like. But some of us will remember the old ones, which were just a single colour, a fairly sort of dull sort of colour. And they got rid of those ones. They introduced the new ones in large part because so many... About one in 30 of all the old one pound coins in circulation were fake. That's why so often if you used to put your quid in a machine, it would just drop straight out. Because they looked like the real thing, but they were false. And in the end, they were worthless. Is it real? True or false? a significant question with significant consequences. We are in the final section of the Sermon on the Mount and the final section of the Sermon on the Mount is a very binary <coughs> section. There are lots of pairs, lots of twos. Jesus is really wanting to impress on his followers and on the crowds who gathered to listen in. He wants them to be clear that ultimately in life there are only two ways to go. You are either with Jesus or you're apart from Jesus. That's what we thought about last week in verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. 
For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Very simply put, two ways, two gates, two roads, two destinations, one choice to make. And just as there are only two ways to go in life, well, so there are only two kinds of people. People with Jesus, journeying with him towards life, or people who have chosen to be apart from him, journeying away from him towards destruction. Now, of course, if we're people who want life, if we're people who have recognised the, the goodness and the grace and the forgiveness and the blessing and the belonging that is only found with Jesus, well, we will want to journey being led by and walking alongside others who are journeying with Jesus. If we're to stay on the narrow way, then we'll need fellow travellers. We won't want to fall in line behind or fall in step with those who are journeying in the other direction, those who are journeying away from Jesus, away from life. But Jesus warns us in our passage today, though there are two types of people, sometimes those two types can look very alike. And he wants to warn us about the false. The false prophet, the false disciple, the ones who can look like the real thing, can look true, but in fact be false, and therefore are to be avoided. And the headings in uh, our church Bibles say true and false prophets and true and false disciples. But in fact, Jesus doesn't really talk in any detail about the true version of either. We may well say that that's because he's been describing them for the past two and a bit chapters. But here his focus is on describing the false ones, the fakes. So that we're warned as to what we need to look out for, what we need to avoid if we want to be true. So let's take a look at them in turn, shall we? Firstly, the false prophets. Watch out for false prophets, he says in verse 15. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And, I mean, the warning is easy to grasp. Watch out for false prophets. The, the danger is clear. You don't want to listen to someone who is going to tell you things that aren't true. You don't want someone to speak to you who purports to speak for God, that's what prophets do, but who in fact does no such thing. That is a, a recipe for being led astray, that is a recipe for being led off the narrow way and towards disaster. So the danger is clear, but the problem is that the false prophets aren't. So spotting the danger isn't easy. A ferocious wolf would be fairly easy to spot. If you were out and about on a country stroll one day and snarling and snob slobbering towards you across the field came a growling, fang-toothed creature, well, you'd know that you need to take some sort of evasive action. Whereas if you saw a sheep in a field, well, I imagine you'd be pretty chill about that. The wolves out there are fairly easy to spot in our world. I don't know, the, the angry atheists, the secular humanists, the, the preachers of, of other gods and other religions. It's pretty obvious that they want to lead people away from Jesus. There's no disguising that. They tell you straight up that that's what they want to do. Now that's not who Jesus is referring to here. It's the ones in the sheepfold. It's the ones within God's 
people. It's the wolves in sheep's clothing that are the real danger. And the existence and the serious risk posed by such people is a serious issue. And it's not only brought to our attention here by Jesus, it's a repeated Bible warning. And in Acts chapter 20, Paul tells the Ephesian elders as he kind of leaves them to, uh, to go on his journey towards Rome uh, and leaves them to go and take care of the church in Ephesus, tells them to watch out for those savage wolves who will come in amongst the flock. Or if you were here a, a year or so ago, we looked at the book of Jude together. You might remember that Jude's reluctant rallying cry was for people to guard and stand for truth in the face of pervasive false prophets within the church. So this really matters, but it is really tricky. And so the obvious question is, how do you spot the true from the false? Well, that's what Jesus goes on to explain from verse 16. By their fruit, you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognise them. How do you spot the true from the false? Well, Jesus says, you test the fruit. And how do you know whether a fruit bush is a real fruit bush? How do you know whether that vine-looking plant it is really a vine or whether it's just a weed? Now, in actual plant terms, I'm, I've got to confess to you, I mean, I'm rubbish at this kind of thing. Occasionally, someone will say to me here, something like, Chris, we really ought to do something about that massive weed growing up outside the chapel. And I'll not have noticed, because I'll have been thinking, oh, that plant's growing rather well. <laughs> But even I can get my head around the difference between a vine and a thorn bush. And the difference is grapes. The difference is what the plant produces. You test the fruit. But, okay, Jesus, that makes sense, but what is the fruit? We can understand the picture, but what does that mean in practice? Well, I think we know what the fruit is because we've just had two and a half chapters of it in the Sermon on the Mount. There Jesus has described the fruit that genuine kingdom faith will produce. And we've seen the opposite described in the sermon. The fruit of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in their legalism, their judgmentalism, their hypocrisy. The bad fruit of the broad road as opposed to the fruit of righteousness, of living in line with Jesus' narrow way. So when Jesus talks here about good fruit, he's talking about character and value and a concern for love and righteousness. He, he's talking, if you like, about the fruit of the Spirit and not the fruit of success. Maybe especially when we think about prophets today, we think about ministers or we think about ministries, we think about preachers and leaders and, and church movements. And it'd be easy there if we were thinking that, that being fruitful is about being successful to judge the fruit of somebody by the results that they achieve. Are they popular? Are their churches big? Are their YouTube channels getting millions of hits? Are lots of people hearing about Jesus? because of them. But when we recognise, I think, the context of what Jesus is saying, what good fruit really is, then Jesus would warn us that something could be very successful, humanly speaking, and very harmful. Because it might look like the real thing on the surface, 
but be false. Now we're not to look for fruit that can be measured numerically, but for fruit that reflects the true fruit of obedience to the commands of Jesus, ethically. And I think we can look for that in two ways. We can look for the fruit in the lives of prophets themselves, and we can look at the fruit produced in the lives of those who listen to them. Sadly, we have no shortage of examples of false prophets whose falsehood has come to light in their own lives. Whether that be the greed of some of the prosperity preachers or the moral failure of some of the permissive preachers or just because it has been in the news and so much again recently we could think of a man like John Smythe and the evangelical camp leader and who physically abused so many young men 20 or 30 years ago a wolf in sheep's clothing, purporting to be a faithful prophet, a disciple, but bearing only the most rotten of fruits. The tragedy, of course, compounded because even as his falsehood became known, Jesus' words here were not heeded as they should have been. The falsehood was not rooted out. Sometimes the fruit will be apparent in the lives of the prophets themselves, and sometimes the fruit will become apparent in the lives of those who listen to them. And I spent some time recently with uh, someone who'd come out of a movement of churches um, called the Crowded House, um, movement. It was led by a man called Steve Timmis. It was a movement that bore lots and lots of very promising gospel hallmarks. Steve Timmis was a very powerful um, preacher, teacher, leader, and um, seemingly having a very powerful impact. And the person I was speaking to said to me, we were told that anyone who left our church even if they went to another good church, was to be totally cut off. And they became disillusioned with it and moved to go to an FIC church in the town where they lived. And I was, the person speaking to me said, when we left, we lost all our friends from there because it was all about loyalty to the church and it was all about loyalty to Steve as the leader. That's not Jesus' way. That's not kingdom fruit. Other related issues have become clear about that was a, a movement in recent years. By their fruit, you will recognise them. So friends, we need to be aware, not alarmed, but aware. Jesus warns us here, but he also assures, I think, by your fruit, by, sorry, by their fruit, you will recognise them. These things, Jesus says, maybe over time, but these things will become clear. So we need to be aware, we need to be on the lookout. Now let me just caution on that, that we need to be on the lookout, but that doesn't mean we need to go looking. We're not called here by Jesus to pick up our pitchforks and head on out heresy hunting. Sadly, some Christians seem to relish, almost revel in that. No, we need not always assume ill of others. 
but we must not always naively assume the best. We must test the fruit. And you must do that here. And if the fruit of my life and ministry proves bad, it is your job and duty as the members and guardians of the truth at this church to turf me out of the sheepfold. Okay? So we must be aware of false prophets. And then secondly, we must avoid being false disciples. In verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons, and in your name, perform many miracles. And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. And uh, again, here the issue is somewhat similar. There's a clear outward appearance of allegiance. These are people who gladly call themselves Christian. Indeed, they enjoy the trappings and something of the experience of being a Christian. But in what Jesus described of them, we see that they don't truly trust Jesus. In fact, it seems like they mostly trust themselves. They are in it for themselves. That, I think, is why the examples given, the examples of prophecy and driving out demons, performing many miracles, they are examples of very public, very showy things. Again, the Pharisees of Jesus' day, I think, provide an example of this kind of human-centric religion, performing religious acts so that they would win the admiration of others. And again, these things may very well bring with them a real sense of fruitfulness if we equate fruit with human success. It may look like a great work is being done. People flocking to the, the miracle workers a spiritual showman, drinking in a, a great emotional experience, but that's because the way it offered is broad and easy and false. Not the true way of King Jesus and conformity to his commands. It's not enough, Jesus says, to just say, Lord, Lord, to just kind of verbally assent to belief in Jesus, just to tick the box. True disciples, Jesus says, will bear the fruit of following him in their lives. They will do the will of his Father, who is in heaven. There's a connection between our, our heads and our hearts and our hands. A connection between what we believe and what we do. The evidence of one ought to be seen in the other, as we seek to do the will of the Father. If I say that I'm a follower of Jesus and yet my life doesn't bear any evidence of that, well then I ought to at the very least ask myself the question. Because the chief characteristic of a true disciple of Jesus is obedience. Now, let me pause and say this very, very carefully in the hope of saying it very clearly. No one will enter the kingdom of Jesus on account of their obedience. We are not saved by our works, but by our faith in Jesus who saves. But no one will enter who has not been obedient as a result of their faith. Now that is so important, I want to say it again. The chief characteristic of a true disciple of Jesus is obedience. The one who does the will of the Father. 
but no one will enter the kingdom of Jesus on account of their obedience. We are not saved by our works, but by our faith in Jesus who saved us. But no one will enter who hasn't been obedient as a result of their faith. For that is the mark of true faith. So this is a real challenge. It's one that we ought to take seriously and soberly. They are sober words. I never knew you. And when I was a teenager, there was a guy at our church called Butty. And he was actually, his name was Ian Butterfield. Ian M. Butterfield. He always used the middle initial. But everyone called him Butty. And um, he used to write plays. Uh, and he wrote a play called I Never Knew You that was kind of based around these verses and it contained kind of a number of scenes of people just banging on doors. And I remember sitting in our church and watching, I don't know how I must have been, a young teenager or something like that, I expect, and finding the whole thing very, very unnerving. I never knew you. And Jesus aims, I think, to lovingly unnerve us to check us in our steps, so that we might check ourselves in our commitment to following him, to obeying his commands, to doing the will of his Father. Now it might be that this doesn't feel very festive, but maybe Christmas, as we approach it, is the ideal time in God's providence for a message like this, when in some ways the, the whole nation, in some respects, for a few weeks says, Lord, Lord, acknowledges Jesus in some small sense, wants the trappings, wants the frills, wants the goodness of being Christians in a Christian country, singing the carols, looking on the baby in the manger and saying, No. Oh, it's nice. But living for Jesus, seeking his kingdom, doing the will of his Father, oh, I think that's a bit much, isn't it? I think that's a step too far. We should not be falsely assured simply because we say, Lord, Lord. But, brothers and sisters, neither should we lack assurance. Because the Saviour who warns us in this way is the Saviour who loves us. Who loved us so much, he was prepared to die. So that we who merit nothing of his kingdom might be welcomed into it with open arms. If this passage serves this morning to shake our confidence in us, then no bad thing. May God use it to increase our faith and our hope in him and in him alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he loves his people enough to warn us of the dangers we face on the journey. Please, Heavenly Father, help us to be aware. Please help us not to be deceived by false prophets. Please help us not to deceive ourselves and so be false disciples. Please let us humble ourselves in faith and in obedience to your word, knowing that we are saved by faith, and knowing therefore that we are safe in Christ. 
please help us and please help us to help one another in this. We thank you so much, Heavenly Father, that we do not journey alone. Please help us um, to be those uh, who in real unity tread the narrow way together so that we all make it safely home. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.